For your reading, we embrace you with our love and our kindness. We are graced by your presence. Since it's been such a long time since I've preached, uh, I think I said 22 years ago, which was somewhat of a shock, I thought maybe I needed a little warm-up this morning. So I thought maybe we'd have a little Bible pop quiz. Well, a silent Bible pop quiz. How's that? <laughs> I'm going to ask a, a question, and you can just think about what your answer is. Uh, and then we'll just talk about that a little bit. The question is, who, what was the name of the first Gentile con uh, convert to Christianity? the name of the first Gentile convert to Christianity. Now we would think that that would probably be a rather important piece of information because it would tell us something about what was happening in the church, what Jesus had left as instructions to who the message is going to go out, it would tell us something about what's happening among the leadership there, what their vision for the church was, who was going to be there. And so this is, I think, a very interesting piece of information. So I'm just going to ask you a couple of things. If you, can, if you have a name in mind, uh, that's, that's fine. I'm going to ask for one familiar one. And if you are saying, I don't know the name of that person. That's fine, too. How many of you might have had in mind the name of Cornelius? Cornelius, the Roman centurion. That's a very popular answer. It's one that I think many of us think of, certainly throughout my entire life from the time I was young. I had the impression from everything I heard in church that Cornelius was the first convert. But there is another one, and I'm going to read his story right now, and then we'll talk a little bit about him. Acts 8, 29 through 36. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandake, the queen of Ethiopia. And the man had gone to Jerusalem to worship on his way home, he was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. And the spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran to the chariot, and he heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. He said to him, do you understand what you are reading? How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. 
He was led like a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before his shearer is silent. So he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me please who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. And as they traveled along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away and the eunuch did not see him again, but he went on his way rejoicing. Let us pray. Dear God, may your word be as a sharp two-edged sword, piercing to our innermost hearts with your liberating truth. May your spirit blow like a fresh wind through this sanctuary, this city, this nation, this world, showing us how to become agents of transformation. Show us how to be like Philip. May we be the ones to fulfill the gospel of Christ's peace to all those who are persecuted, marginalized, and oppressed, no matter who they are or where they are or how different they are from ourselves. And the people said, Amen. Amen. <laughs> the title of my sermon this morning is Fulfilling the Gospel of Christ. At this time in our story, Christ has ascended. The apostles were beginning to preach and perform miracles. Last week we heard the story of how Peter raised Dorcas from the dead. It is a time of great chaos and upheaval. Jesus is gone. The rules are not yet established for who is in charge and what will happen. Who is in and who is out? What does the future look like? Saul of Tarsus, soon to be the Apostle Paul, is rounding up Christians, persecuting them and killing them. The 12 disciples, apostles, have scattered from Jerusalem and are preaching the gospel in Judea and Samaria, and they're taking their cues from the Holy Spirit. What is it that we are going to be doing next? Philip is not one of our better known apostles, usually. He's not as flashy as Peter is, and he's not so much in the inner circle as James and John but he is out doing his job. And the Spirit of the Lord tells Philip to go down to a far out place in the wilderness, a desert road from Jerusalem toward Gaza. He's on his way and an angel says to Philip, go down to that chariot, look down there and see that chariot. Go down there and see what is happening. Now there is probably a retinue accompanying the Ethiopian eunuch, 
because he is a high official. There are probably horses and chariots. So Philip goes down there, and the Ethiopian eunuch is sitting in his chariot. It's kind of a calf, uh, kind of a, a Cadillac convertible sort of chariot. Very fancy because he is a wealthy and powerful man. And Philip hears him reading. Now, this person in the chariot, when I said, if you don't know his name, that is a good answer because we don't know his name. The gospel writer says this information, he's an Ethiopian eunuch of high status. So he's actually f referring to him in this way. He is a black African man who is sexually different what, from what most people of his day would think of as normal. In our time, he might be called LGBTQ++. He might be referred to as queer. We might not know what to call him. We might think when we see him from his appearance, possibly drag queen. Interesting who God picks out to be the first Gentile convert. Let's take a closer look at our eunuch. What is a eunuch? Well, he was probably a person who had undergone gender realignment, reassignment surgery at a very early age. Because, very likely, he was a victim of government-sponsored slave tracking, trafficking, or private enterprise slavers who were catering to the rich and famous. You see, there were many kings and empires in those days, and they went out to conquer and take territory. And when they did so, when they overcame a new territory, they often killed the parents of the royalty and the wealthy and took their women and children as captives and carried them away, sometimes to far dif dif distant places. And so, when those male children were carried away, they could often be intended to serve in palaces or in harems. And so at an early age, they would have their testicles removed and they would be as helpless children, unable to make a sound in their own defense. They had no control over their bodies. They served in the harems because since they could not have normal sexual relations, they would not contaminate the bloodline. Often, the people who were taken could be princes or royalty themselves, so they could be very intelligent and sometimes well-educated. They looked different because the surgery made their bodies soft and feminine and weak, compared to other men, which reduced any masculine tendencies toward fighting and warfare. Their voices would stay as they were when they were a child. 
possibly sounding very feminine. Even though they were castrated, that did not mean that they did not have sexual feelings and desires. So they often experienced physical and psychological torment. With no families or ability to have children, they were outcasts. They were alone in the world. And even when they were useful servants, they were almost universally despised because of their difference, their queerness. Our anonymous eunuch had been to Jerusalem to worship and being such a prominent person, the head treasurer of a prominent queen, he probably had this retinue around him. But we do not need to fool ourselves that he had the red carpet rolled out for him in Jerusalem. He came there to worship. But the Jewish laws were very restrictive about who could participate in the religious rites. Our eunuch was a deeply spiritual man, a searcher, a seeker. But the rules were, according to Deuteronomy 23.1, no one whose testicles are crushed or whose penis is cut off shall be admitted to the assembly of the Lord. Rules for priests were even more restricted for anyone who had a defect, such as being blind, lame, having a limb too long or too short, having a broken arm or leg, a hunchback, a dwarf, anyone with a growth in his eye, anyone who had boil scars or crushed testicles, not to mention women. In the temple area in Jerusalem, there, was, there were different sections marked off for certain kinds of people. The farthest out was the Gentile court, and Gentiles could be in that area. Next inward was the women's court. Then there was the Jewish men's court, and now we're getting into the hierarchy, the patriarchy, that defines who has status. And then the priests, and then finally, the Holy of Holies, the place where God resides. So our eunuch carries all this baggage with him. He has come here hopeful, but his hopes have not been fulfilled. He's reading a passage, he says, uh, Philip asks him, do you know what you're reading? And he says, well, no, because how would I know if someone doesn't teach me? But he went all the way to Jerusalem, and nobody who knew who was a priest, who was a teacher, had had the courtesy to answer his questions. So why is our eunuch nameless? Why is he anonymous? Why can't we today put the first Gentile Christian's name up on a billboard and say, look there, this was the first one. He was a black African man who was sexually deviant, queer, strange, not normal in the eyes of them then. This is the one Christ chooses as the first. Interesting. Now why is he anonymous? Why did the author of Acts make him anonymous? Well, I don't think it's an accident. I think he does it for good reason. You see, a couple of chapters later, Luke 
tells us the story of Cornelius. And there is a lot of fanfare. There's a whole social setting, a family, a household, neighbors. There is a vision and a cohort, probably a soldier cohort, is sent to Jerusalem to get Peter. And Peter has a vision. And then an angel appeared to him. We have the whole heavenly panorama opening surrounding Cornelius. But what about this fact, even though this is the big beginning of the spread of the gospel to all nations? Two chapters earlier, Luke tells this story of a nameless person an outcast, one who can't get into the temple, one who can't get his questions answered, one who can't be a part of the worship. And so, indeed, this is the one Christ chooses. I think Luke does it because he wants to make a point about the type of person now, the gospel went on and spread around the world. And it's in every nation as far as we know today. But is the gospel of Christ fulfilled? Because the first Gentile, arguably the first, there might have been another one, but this is the story we have. This person's legacy, where is it? So let's look at what happens with Philip and the eunuch. Philip goes down and he hears him reading from this passage. And it's this passage of scripture. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch says, that sounds like me. That sounds like who I am. That's why he wants to know, he says, is the prophet talking about himself or somebody else? And Philip sees into the heart of the Ethiopian eunuch, and he begins right there, and he preaches to him the good news of the gospel of Christ. Because the eunuch was looking for someone who understood him, someone who felt his pain, someone who entered into his personal loss and tragedy, someone who has experienced helplessness, whose voice was silenced, who had no voice no control over the decisions about his body. Someone who had been humiliated and had no justice. Someone who had no opportunity for a home and a family and for generations to come after him and finally is killed even though he is innocent. The eunuch must have been transfixed. Beyond his wildest dreams, for the first time in his life, he feels accepted. Furthermore, Jesus' story lets him know that he can have self-respect. 
power and transformation, no matter what others may say about him, no matter what they may do, he now knows that there is someone who is like him. He knows the truth deep inside. He is no longer anonymous to himself. He is received. He knows, I am beloved of God. Same body, same voice, same history, but a new heart, a new hope, a new message, a new life. He is so convinced that suddenly, and here is the magic and the miracle in the eunuch's story. There are no sheets coming down from heaven. There is no vision. But there, in the desert, on a desert road, there is water. Lots of water. Enough for two people. He says, what's to prevent me from being baptized? Now, you may say, was there really that much water in the desert? Well, it's on the front of our bulletin cover. That is the spring of Engedi. Down there in the south, in the desert, a magical place, a well-known place. There are these places. They are oases. It's dry all around, and all of a sudden, there's water. And there is the miracle at that moment when it was most needed in a dry, dry place, there was all the water that was needed. And Philip and the eunuch went down into the water. And Philip baptized him. And then Philip was caught away by the Spirit. And the eunuch went on his way rejoicing. It was a new life for the eunuch. He has a new story to tell. He's a new person. And what about Philip? Probably Philip is thinking, oh my God, what am I going to tell the other apostles? Wow, what just happened? What did God just do? And Philip is caught away in amazement. So, let's look at the legacy of those precious few days after Jesus went to heaven, a tumultuous time. Some things worked out well and some things did not. The Peter and Cornelius story did very well, ultimately, even though there was enormous persecution. But the gospel did indeed spread to all the world, and we can see that today. But what about the legacy of the Ethiopian eunuch? Where is his legacy in the church, in the world? It's been 2,000 years, and the gospel message for the anonymous, the nameless people. That gospel of the very first Christian Gentile convert has still not penetrated the church, has not been shared with the world. The good news of the gospel of Jesus to the eunuch has not been the good news around the world. There is still persecution for those who are different, for the marginalized, the persecuted, the downcast, the queer, the disabled, the disfigured, the other that is not like us. This is the offense of the gospel 
that has not been realized in our world. So this is the question I'm asking today. Where are the Phillips among us? These are the ones who hear the still small voice and obey it and go down on the desert road. The ones who are willing to go on the same sidewalk, in the same buildings, in the same restrooms. Where are the Phillips? Who will get in the chariot and ride? Who will answer the questions? I leave you with this question today. How can you and I be a Philip today? How can our church be a Philip church? How can we stand with the Ethiopian eunuch in fulfilling the gospel of Christ to those who Christ chose first? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, my rock and my redeemer. And the people said, Amen.